Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very challenging one on In the Crucible with Christ. Does that immediately suggest what it's talking about? Well, let's see. This is lesson number three in that series for July 16 of 2022, entitled The Birdcage? Boy, it's really getting interesting here. Let's begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, crucibles and bird cages, what could that be all about? This lesson has got some challenging ideas, but some very important things for us to think about. Guide us as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Are we like a bird in a cage, Jim? From the writings of Ellen G. White, in the full light of day and in the hearing of the music of the voices, the caged bird is not, will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snitch of this, a trill of that, but never a separate entire melody. But the master covers the cage and places it where the bird will listen to the one song he is to sing in the dark that is without distraction, he tries and tries again to sing that song until it is learned. He breaks forth in perfect heart melody. Then the bird is brought forth, and ever after he can sing that song in the night. Thus God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us, and when we have learned it, amid the shadows of affliction, we can sing it ever afterwards. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 472, Paragraph two. Okay, now the big question for our lessons to this today and for really some future lessons is, does God ever literally carry us into trying situations? We, we believe that Satan will tempt us in every way possible. However, does God have anything to do with that? Think of some examples from the Bible where God uh, appears to have s led someone into temptation. How do you understand the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness? Matthew 4.1 seems to suggest that Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's, if you just read it superficial, that's what it sounds like. You, compare, you can compare Mark 1.12 and 13 and Luke 4.1-2, which say, sort of the same thing. God did not lead Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. Jesus went into the wilderness to spend time with his father in preparation for his life work. At the end of that time, the devil was allowed to tempt him. What else do we know about that, Carrie? I'm waiting for that thing to stop. <laughs> When Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. He did not invite temptation. He went to the wilderness to be left al to, to be, be alone, alone, to contemplate his mission and work. By fasting and prayer, he was to brace himself for the blood-stained path he must travel. But Satan knew that the Savior had gone into the wilderness and he thought this the best time to approach him. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 114, paragraph 2. I, you know, I, I think often about that panorama that we're going to be shown at the third coming and probably going to be shown sooner than that if, we're, if we get to heaven. Uh, and probably study it for the rest of eternity. What did Jesus say with his father during those 40 days? What was their conversation about? How did they prepare for the, for the mission that he was gonna to have to take up for the next three and a half years? Uh, we know a little bit about what Satan had to say when he came, but what did Jesus say to his father during the first 39 or 40 days or whatever? I'd love to know more about that. Do you think they talked continuously or did well, they? What we do? What did they do? Yeah, what we do know is that often Jesus would spend entire nights, even during his ministry, discussing with his father about what they would do the next day. 
So uh, I, I think they did quite a lot of talking. And I, you know, I don't know whether the father appeared to him in human form and they discussed things just like that, or whether God just appeared to, just spoke to him. But uh, obviously Jesus said, you know, Ellen White says that the father taught him when he was a child, as a child. Um, and we're told that Jesus had, that we have every opportunity that Jesus had. I yes. don't remember being taught by God. You don't remember hearing his voice? I don't. No. Oh dear. We, we've got to do a little catching up to do, huh? A lot. However, later in that same book, the book Desire of Ages, Ellen White wrote, Often when placed in a trying situation, we doubt that the Spirit of God has been leading us. But it was the Spirit's leading that brought Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So that, <clears throat> again, seems to suggest yeah. that was the purpose. Well, that's, that's, she's, she's literally quoting from Matthew. Yeah. When God brings us into trial, he has a purpose to accomplish for our good. Jesus did not presume on God's promises by going unbidden into temptation. Neither did he give up to despondency when temptation came upon him, nor should we. Desire of Ages 126. Okay, so that's just a few pages later, isn't it? God certainly allowed Job to be tempted by the devil, and the devil was working through Job's three friends. I mean, How's that for a straightforward example? I mean, <laughs> the devil shows up and what, who speaks first? God says, have you considered my servant Job? God speaking to the devil. Well, But did, did Job uh, have conversation uh, with, the, with the devil? He had conversation with so-called friends. I mean, you've yeah, got friends yeah, like yeah. that. How many enemies I'm, do you I'm, need? I was talking about the, the, the conversations in heaven. The, with God and, 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 uh, Satan. and Satan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, we're going to talk more about this. So, and God did keep keep a, a protection on Job beyond which he uh, you, Satan you can't was kill allowed him. to go. You can't kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, you couldn't touch him. Then right. The second time you could touch him, but you yeah. can't kill him. You yeah. Can't take his life. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not much of a, not much of a protection at that point in time. Yeah, well, but you know, look at what he had. But but what do people go through today in in in, in health and and uh, social and yeah. psychological uh, trials that, that that people have today? I mean, yeah. you know, we've got that story from close to five thousand or four thousand years ago, thirty five hundred years yeah. ago, and uh, what we got today, it's yeah. History repeats itself in one way or another. Well, let's think about another case. What about the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Was placed in the Garden of Eden, close to the tree of life, not to be a temptation to Adam and Eve, but to be a protection from them in the ongoing conflict between God and Satan. That conflict, which we call the great controversy or the, great, or the cosmic conflict. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, what? What are you talking about? Well, let's look at that very carefully. That tree was not primarily a test of obedience. It was there to protect them. Satan was limited to that one tree. Otherwise, he would have followed them wherever they went in the garden, popping up from behind every bush, flower, or tree, trying to tempt them, wouldn't he? Sure. If Satan had been free to tempt them whenever and wherever he wanted, wouldn't he have gone to the tree of life? Of course. Furthermore, Satan knew that our first parents had been told not to go to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why do you think God told them not to go to that one particular tree? Myra? Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. So, don't go to that yeah. tree. Don't go to that tree is right. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them, and to be, and to be content with the instruction that he had seen fit to impart. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, paragraph. Wow, what a change in understanding if you understand the context of the great controversy and understand uh, and, of course, 
that's one of the main things Ellen White has done for us to get us to take that overarching larger view. So how do you understand the experience when the children of Israel were guided down a narrow ravine with mountains on both sides and the Red Sea in front of them? Doesn't that sound like leading somebody into trouble? Soon they looked back and saw the Egyptian military coming to attack them. Why would God allow such a situation? Why did he lead them down to the edge of the water? Well, then God delivered them. The story in Exodus 14 clearly explains that after the miracles of parting the sea, the, quote, Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Who's going to know? Egyptians. The Egyptians. Huh? But I they're mean, dead. Huh? But they're going to be well, dead. Well, some of them were dead, but the message got back to the others. And, I mean, they should have known already. I mean, obviously, what ten plagues, yeah. at the end of ten plagues, or <laughs> somewhere sooner than that, they should have gotten the message right. But it sounds like that. And finally, what do we read? Exodus 14, 31. When the Israelites saw the great powers which the Lord had defeated the Egyptians, they stood in awe of the Lord, and they had faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses, from our Good News Bible. Wow. I so, had never pictured that in my head until reading this, that they were going essentially in a funnel, mm -hmm. and I mean, the Egyptians had to go, we got them now. We don't yep. have to worry. They can't go anywhere. Yep. Slow down, guys. Take yeah. it easy. Let's have lunch. Get some water. Mm -hmm. Let's yep. Getting ready for the battle. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you got these guys you know, go. prisoned in. Knowing what we know about this story, we recognize that the children of Israel were not led down to the edge of the water to a dead end. That was where they needed to go to escape Egyptian sovereignty by passing through the Red Sea. And those of you who keep track of such things, if you pay attention to what's in places like uh, Biblical Archaeology Review and so forth, you know that uh, there is very, let's say, in increasing evidence that they crossed the Red Sea over on the side of Saudi Arabia and that the, what we call Mount Sinai was actually Jabal Allah's over on um, in, in Saudi Arabia, northwestern Saudi Arabia. So, in fact, all of the Sinai Peninsula was in Egyptian control. So in order to get out of Egyptian territory, you would have had to cross out of the Sinai Peninsula. So, uh, that's what happened. When we find ourselves in a difficult position, how can we know for sure if God has led us there? We must be very careful about deceiving ourselves. We can, teach, we can convince ourselves of all kinds of craziness. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, Jim? Who can understand the human heart? There is nothing else is so de deceitful. It is too thick to be he healed. So we are exceptionally good at deceiving who? Ourselves. Ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. It's well, that's uh, not a whole lot different than uh, what uh, Jeremiah seven, sixteen and following. Mm -hmm. Is it thy uh, people are doing all these bad things? And he says, but it is I whom they provoke it rather than themselves to their own confusion. Yeah. The sin is self-destructive as opposed yeah. to. So after those incredible experiences of watching the ten plagues fall on the Egyptians and then being led to cross on the dry land between the, through the Red Sea, amazingly, the Israelites were still not ready to trust God completely for their needs when trouble came. Gary? Uh, I'm speaking from Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. The whole Israelite community left the desert of sin moving from one place to another at the command of the Lord. They made camp at Rephidim, but there was no water there to drink. And that's from the Good News Bible. Oh boy, our troubles aren't over yet, right? No. Surely you must recognize the water is a necessity. It's not just a want or a desire. This experience of being at a place where they needed water and there was none available was repeated later at least twice. I mean, you can imagine, you're leading a group of maybe two million people through a very desert territory, and you have to supply them water from unusual sources, let's say, every day 
what are the chances in 40 years there's going to be a few times when you run out of water? How are you going to transport water with you? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay. Exodus 15, 22 to 27. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. For three days they walked through the desert but found no water. So they must have been able to, I'm sure they had uh, bags made out of animal skins and so forth that they, that they carried water in. Uh, there must have been springs in the desert periodically for them to get water. Uh, how much that's of the implication. How much of a spring do you need for two million people? That's a pretty big river. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> then they came to a place called Mera, but the water there was so bitter that they could not drink it. This is why, that is why it was named Mera. The people complained to Moses and asked, What are we going to drink? Moses prayed earnestly to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, which he threw into the water, and the water became fit to drink. What did that water contain? What did that wood contain? Wood contain? What did the water contain? What did the wood contain? Yeah, what made the water bitter? And what, what would correct that? Yeah. A pure miracle? Probably. There the Lord gave them laws to live by, and there he also tested them. He said, if you will obey me completely by doing what I consider right and by keeping my commands, I will not punish you with any of the diseases that I brought on the Egyptians. I am the Lord, the one who heals you. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm going to interrupt there. What kind of diseases did he brought upon the Egyptians? Yes. Is he talking about the, t the, the plagues? Yeah. I mean, there was all kinds of diseases involved in the plague, so I guess that's probably what he was talking about. Okay. Next they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. There they camped by the water, from Good News Bible. Yeah. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. You want to go ahead and with, well, Myra, do you want to go for that one? Sure. The whole Israelite community left the desert of sin, moving from one place to another at the command of the Lord. They made their camp at Rephidim. Yeah, Rephidim. Ref but there was no water there to drink. So they complained to Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses answered, why are you complaining? Why are you putting the Lord to the test? But the people were very thirsty and continued to complain to Moses. They said, why did you bring us out to, out of us, bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses prayed earnestly to the Lord and said, what can I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Take some of the leaders of Israel with you and go on ahead of the people. Take along a stick with you, which you struck the Nile, which you, you struck the Nile during the plagues. Yeah. Yes. I will stand before you on the rock of Mount Sinai, strike the rock, and the water will come out of it for the people to drink. Moses did so in the presence of the leaders of Israel. The place is called Massa and Meribah, Meribah mm -hmm. because the Israelites complained and put the Lord to the test when they asked, is the, Lord not, is the Lord with us or not? Good News Bible. It's interesting that in that place over there in Saudi Arabia, where it's very difficult to get to, and only a few people have gone there, but which is a possible correct site for, the, for Mount Sinai, just below it, there's a place in the mountain where it looks like there could have been a fountain, and the, wa uh, the rock is worn as if there's been a lot of water running down there. Nothing going on there now, but uh, that's an interesting addition to the story. Have you ever been tempted to ask if the Lord is with you or us? Have you asked that question personally? What about asking that question regarding your local church or even the Seventh-day Adventist church as a whole? Hmm, anybody ever asked that question? Is it true that God cannot be tempted by evil? Does he himself tempt no one? 
James 1.13 tells us, if people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one, from our Good News Bible. Now, we probably need to stop and tell you that in the languages, both Hebrew and Greek, the word for testing and tempting is the same. So you have to you have to look at it in the context to say, does God have the right to test us? We're going to talk about that a lot more next time. But this crucible thing, that's, t that's a kind of testing, isn't it? I mean, we talk about crucibles, we're talking about testing. So God could test us. So when it comes to the translator's job, they have to say, is this tempting or is this testing? So it depends upon one's paradigm how yeah. one's going to translate that. Is that correct? Very much so. And what was, what would be the purpose of uh, God tempting? Is it is God not more should be recognized as being an educator, a teacher, as opposed to because God doesn't need the information. There's no information yeah, yeah. that the the infinite one needs. Well, but he tested Job, didn't he? Mm, who did? Well, God allowed it. Yeah, well, there's, that's, that's the point. It. Well, they, they accuse that state. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent yeah. and that which he allows. You but just, God doesn't need to be an active agent. Yeah, he, no, you know, it's I, not, it's I believe not for God's the, benefit, yeah. The angels, the, what we call the, the Elohim, they're able to do things. Mm -hmm. the, the, we, we raised thinking that we have a guardian angel. Well, what are they doing? Uh, just following us around? Are they... Influence, yeah, well, having some influence. Yeah. Well, you talked about education. Do teachers sometimes give us tests? <laughs> well, but it, <laughs> do they tempt us? Yeah. That's, well, so that's a, that's that's the point. You you have to decide when in this given situation, would you call this a test? You're you're trying to help the student to learn and grow, or is this a temptation? And that depends on how you read the context and how you think the story should be interpreted. But if the infant already knows, it's not for his information, it's, yeah, it's for that's, education on the part of yeah. even others to, to observe how a person yeah. reacts. And, and of course, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the great controversy. Exactly. Um, God is, is, has to demonstrate things. <laughs> this earth is, the, is what we call the theater uh, 1 Corinthians 4 9, this is the theater of the universe. The entire universe is watching us. And you can be sure at some of these critical points in the great controversy, I mean some of the ones we mentioned, when Job was tested, you can be sure that the entire universe is watching. Okay, God says this guy is, is a good man, he's going to be okay. Watch. See what the devil can do to him. And if they weren't watching the first time, they got to look <laughs> at the video replay. Yep. Yeah. Well, knowing what we know about the great controversy, our, we are certain that God has already won. He's won. So that means that when it's all over, who's going to be the victor? God is going to be the victor. Jesus answered the questions and accusations of Satan through his life and his death. We should not have any questions about that. So. There may be some rough road between here and there, but when we come to the other end, who's going to come out victorious? We know it's, God is going to be the one who's victorious. So no matter what our temptations may be, even if they could be life-threatening, we know that God has a final, wonderful home prepared for us. We can live forever in that perfect environment. So why did Peter suggest that God allows us to be tested? 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Is that mine? Yes. Okay. Uh, be glad about this, even though it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. And that's the Good News Bible. It's interesting that these words are written by Peter. 
And I remember he had a little bit of an incident with Paul, didn't he, in the city of, of, of um, Antioch? He went up, Peter went up, he was, Peter was up there, he, Peter went up there and Paul, Peter said, you know, everything's fine here. Peter was associating with Gentiles and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden some people from Jerusalem showed, showed up and Peter didn't want to sit with the Gentiles anymore. You know, we, we, we have to keep our distance here. And Paul just laid into him, you remember? Peter was playing for the audience, huh? Yeah. Peter was writing to a group of people who lived in what is now Western Turkey. Those churches were relatively new, and the number of Christians was very limited. The authorities were against them. Notice the re reassuring words that Peter added a little bit later. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. You love him, although you have not seen him, and you believe in him, although you do not now see him. So you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express, because you are receiving the salvation of your souls, which is the purpose of your faith in him. Good News Bible. So when we stop and think about it, even if we should lose our lives for the sake of Christianity, and how many have lost their lives for Christianity down through the years, how big a price is that to pay for an eternity of bliss? Let us not lose our faith. I mean, I've sometimes said to people, if you were in Christ's place, and you had to go through what he went through, what would you say, even now, would you say, okay, let me die today, and three days from now I'll go to heaven? Would you say yes or no? Not an issue. Huh? Not an issue. Not an issue? You mean the, the answer is obvious? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Our Bible study guide tells a story of a young man who was put into all kinds of troubles, who was into all kinds of trouble, including drugs, violence, even some time in jail. But then his life turned around and he was admitted to an Adventist college. At first, things went very well. Then things seemed to start falling apart. His source of money started to dry up. Someone was sponsoring him at school and a close friend turned against him. He repeatedly got sick. He was still fighting his old temptations. He still felt sure that the Lord had guided him to the school. What was wrong? If Alex had come to you, and at that point in time, period in time, what would you what would you have to what would you say to him? Well, I think first of all, we should be clear that the devil does not give up easily. Perhaps you could use some of the following verses. Proverbs three eleven and twelve, when the Lord corrects you, my child, pay close attention, and take it as a warning. The Lord corrects those he loves, as parents correct a child of whom they are proud. Good News Bible, Jeremiah 29, 13. <clears throat> the Lord had said, You will seek me, and you will find me, because you will seek me with all your heart. Good News Bible. And then Romans 8, 28. We know all that in all things God works for good for those who love him, those who whom he has called according to his purpose. And I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. That is a correct translation of this verse. So, you know, King James says all things work together for good. No, it's not all things that work to forget, <laughs> together for good. The word God appears almost at the beginning of that sense. It is God who works for good with those who love him, no matter what the circumstances are under all things. So. That's a, a very significant correction to the King James. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But his answer was, My grace is all you need, for my power is the greatest when you are weak. I am most happy, then, to be proud of my weaknesses in order to feel the protection of Christ's power over me. Wow. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free of love of money and be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Okay. So that means we shouldn't depend on money for things we need to start praying? That's not what that says. Not what it says? No. It says don't love money. Okay. 
you, you have to be responsible and take care of yourself. When we seem to be in the dark, we have been encouraged by Ellen White to look back to the last place where we saw the light. She says that in several different places. That can help us to see where we might have gotten off the path. Quote, but of old the Lord led his people to Rephidim. We read those verses a little earlier. And he may choose to lead us there also, to test our loyalty. He does not always bring us to pleasant places. If he did, in our self-sufficiency, we should forget that he is our helper. He longs to manifest himself to us and to reveal the abundant supplies at our, to, at our disposal. And he permits trial and disappointment to come to us that so we may realize our helplessness. How does God help us to realize our helplessness? Does he put us in situations where we, we don't have an answer? He may put you in a health situation where you finally realize that you aren't mm -hmm. the one to control it. And he learned to call upon him for aid. And that should be the solution, hopefully. He can cause cooling streams to flow from the flinty rock. We've already talked about that. We shall never know until we are face to face with God when we shall see as we are seen and know as we are known how many burdens he has borne for us and how many burdens he would have been glad to bear if with childlike faith we had brought them to him. Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, April 7, 1903, paragraph 4. Uh, you've probably heard this expression before, but there's a story that's told about someone who dreamt that he was w walking down a beach and there's, he sees his footsteps and God is he walking with God, his angel, or God or angel, and he sees these footsteps and all of a sudden, he's, oh, God has abandoned me. There's only one set of footsteps up ahead. And the angel said, no, that's the point where I picked you up and carried you. Those are my footsteps. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we need to recognize more. What methods has God used to try to purify your character and your faith? Do you know of others who have lost their faith from being tempted and tried? What could you do to help them? Now, again, who's always out there to take every opportunity he possibly can to test us, to try us, to tempt us? And the devil and his angels. So there's never a shortage of effort on that side, right? Maybe we should learn something from that. Wasn't it, <clears throat> the, you told the story about the lady who could come up with something good for everyone. So what's good about the devil? He's persistent. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Christian growth only happens when we experience God's unconditional love and when we commit ourselves to love him back unreservedly. Our Bible study guide mentions this in May, June of 2019. Pope Francis sparked a controversy by officially endorsing a change in the Lord's Prayer. Hold on. Does the Pope have the authority to do that? He says he does. Why would he want to? Well, let's talk about that for a moment. What do the Catholics believe about the Bible? They believe that they represent God on earth. The Pope represents God on earth. And, and, and the, it's the church that has produced the Bible, starting out with, of course, Moses and so forth, but they, they think they're right along in the, in the line of Moses and all the other Bible writers and so forth. So they say, it's not the Bible that has to direct us, we're the ones that produce the Bible. So if we need, if the Bible needs to be changed, we can change it. And that's their attitude. Uh, and it's, uh, that's a serious problem because there are a number of churches that take that attitude. We know another church that's fairly popular in this part of the world who believes that also, that they have the authority to stand up and say, no, it's not like that, it should be like this. Well, what happened in this story here? Instead of lead us not into temptation, the new Roman Catholic version of the Lord's Prayer would, le would read, quote, do not lead us, do not let us, fall into temptation. The Pope's main argument was that the translation, quote, lead us not into, tem into temptation, is wrong from theological and pastoral points of view. Okay, as this phrase identifies God as a tempter instead of Satan. So, 
theological and pastoral points of view, where do those come from? That shouldn't be too difficult. Those are human perspectives. That's their ideas about God, sure, I'm not arguing about that, but their human perspectives. Should they take precedence over and superiority over what God himself has said? That's the question. A father claimed the Pope would not lead his son into temptation, but rather help the son up when he falls. One may very well relate to this attempt to excul exculpate God from the status of tempter, trying to get God out of trouble. But changing the text of the Lord's Prayer is not justifiable. Numerous other biblical phrases, much as this one, pose difficulties. The principles uh, of biblical hermeneutics, that's the the process of translating and interpreting, and the history of theology teach us that we must try to understand the text and its message rather than to change the biblical text or its translation to help resolve its mysteries in a way that a certain culture or person feels is more appropriate. So do we interpret, do we take God's words as they are and find a way to fit them in or do we say, okay, God, you didn't do it right. Well, let's, we'll do it our way and we'll change your words so that it's better. Well, which translation of the Bible do we use? Well, of course, they're using their, tra their, their Catholic translations. I know, but no. are we guilty of the same thing with uh, well, a variety of translations? Sure. Yeah, there's, there are a number of translations that, and, and this is a challenge. It's a challenge. We need to be honest here. Nobody can translate, I don't care what you're, get out of the field of, of religion completely. When you translate from one language to another, if you translate enough material, part of it's going to be influenced by your own personal understanding of the situation. It's even, go ahead. even if you transcribe, uh, somebody's giving a, a sermon or a speech or whatever, mm -hmm. and you transcribe it, and then you made it into another language, it's even just even in the same language. Mm -hmm. You don't have the voice inflections and so on and so forth. You can get come up with a different uh, message. And uh, we, we've, got, we've got a couple of escape clauses. One is Jeremiah 8, verse 8. The scribes say, oh, we've got the law, but their lying pen isn't made it into a lie. That's right there in the middle of the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And then you got Matthew 23, starting at verse 13 and following, seven, excuse me, eight times in the King James, seven times in the other trans, most of the other translations, Jesus says, woe unto you scribes, and doesn't say, you are uh, hypocrites, we know that that's what it, what it implies, mm -hmm. that, that, that they're hypocrites. Well, who are the scribes and Pharisees? They're the ones that had the law, they're the teachers, and so forth. So, and all of those people are fallible. Mm-hmm. So that means that we need to be doing what? Taking God's words as we see, read them from text and learning how to interpret them in the larger context of the great controversy, we who have the Adventist version of things and understand that context and not try to change God's way to ma match what we think is our way. And there's nobody in the last 2,000 years that you, we can find in, that's done a better job than Ellen White. Yeah. I mean, that brings the issue of the great controversy. Yeah. Nobody is... A brief study of Matthew 6.13 and its concepts, and let's look at that really quick. Do not bring, up to, bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. So that's another translation of the, of the Lord's Prayer. Um, and its key concepts in both the media and broader biblical context will help us better understand this phrase in the prayer. In the New Testament Greek, both in Matthew and Luke 11, 4, those are the places where we find the Lord's Prayer, use exactly the same wording to render the phrase, quote, lead us not into temptation. This is quoting from the NIV. Thus, the phrase is correctly translated in most versions. Rather than trying to rearrange or reinterpret this verse, we need to understand its meaning. The key verb lead in Greek is the active era subjunct subjunctive form of the verb aispero, which means to carry inward, to bring in, to introduce. So what does that mean? Let's, let's not bring, into, bring ourselves into temptation, right? 
do not lead us or do not let us fall in Matthew 26 40 uh, well, okay there's I'm sorry so there is no mistake here no way of reinterpretation Jesus meant to say do not lead us not do not let us fall in Matthew 26 41 see also mark mark 14 Luke 22 Jesus describes temptation as something one could enter into that's a fairly a lengthy discussion but a challenge challenge something challenging to think about those who argue in favor of changing the wording of this phrase in the Lord's Prayer focus on the word temptation, concluding that God cannot tempt us because he cannot be the source of temptation. But the Greek word for temptation, perosmos, has two distinct meanings. The first is temptation and is related to allurement or enticement to sin. Um, there's several verses on that. Uh, let me just show you, let's just take 1 Timothy 6, 9, for example. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires which pull them down to ruin and destruction. So what's it, what is it that pulls them down to ruin or destruction? Their own desires, right? In this sense, it is true that God is not and cannot be leading us into temptation because he's not the tempter. And we've already read James 13, 1 for 13, clearly, which that clearly establishes. The second meaning of temptation is experiment, trial, probation, or test. In Galatians 4.14, let's look at that really quickly. But even though my physical condition was a great trial to you, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you received me as you would an angel from heaven. You received me as you would G Christ Jesus. So his physical aim, well, that was a trial to them. There's no question about the fact that it was a trial to them. But they, they were very, uh, very congenial and helped him. Paul's illness was a trial to the Galatians. And in 1 Peter 4.12, Peter admonishes Christians not to be surprised by the trial or ordeal that befell them. That's in our Bible study guide, pages 39 and 40. Um, Notice how the Bible uses the expression fall or fell into temptation. 1 Timothy 6, 9, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires which pull them down to ruin and destruction, as I had just mentioned. James 1, 13 and 14 again, If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say this temptation comes from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away by what? Their own. Their own evil desires. And I should not be just reading all these. Go ahead. Galatians 4.14 4, But even though my physical condition was great trial to you, you did not despise or reject me. Instead, you received me as you would an angel from heaven. You received me as you would Christ Jesus, Good News Bible. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. What do you think his physical condition was? And how would that have given trial to them? It was, an eye, it was an eye disorder. Careful. Exactly what? Yeah. We're Some not sure. serious scholars looking at that think that it's an eye condition, and some have suggested that maybe it was a result of his being blinded on the road to Damascus, Damascus. That's, that's a possibility. So how could that be a temptation or a trial for the people he's working with? Especially at night, it's very possible they had to lead him around yeah. by the hand. Yeah. Okay, go ahead with First Peter 4.12, my dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. The Bible study guide says, perhaps James gives the most explicit explanation of the process of temptation, especially as he uses the new meaning, the two, meaning, meaning. The two meanings of temptation together with the same passage. And we talked James about that earlier, didn't we? The same word can mean testing, it can also mean tempting. Okay? Uh, James 1. Uh, he affirms. 2 and 12. And must not say that God tempts him, because God does not tempt anyone, James 1.13. Rather, each person wanders away from God when enticed or tempted by their own desire, James 1.14. Thus, in the New Testament, temptation 
means by seduction means both means both seduction in sin and probation so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I like that language they use there but basically it's saying that the word the Greek word there can mean temptation as in you're trying to draw someone into sin but it also could be testing and God does test from the Old Testament, I, I, there's a, a Isaiah 63:17. If you can pull, pull one up, and I'll read one. I'll read one from Brenton. In practically all the all the translations, uh, and I've, I've collected about 43 um, uh, study Bibles, and they quite a range. Some of them will take the position that God doesn't do it. Others take the position that it does. But read here from the, um, this is the Brenton's uh, um, Septuagint. Isaiah 63, 17. Why hast thou caused us to err, O Lord, from thy way, and hast hardened our hearts, that we should not fear thee? Return my, thy servant's sake for the sake of the tribes of thine inheritance. Practically all of them say it basically that way. Mm -hmm. But the clear word says it, why has God, God, why have you permitted us, or God uh, allowed to? Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, in the, the SDA Bible commentary, there's a, uh, if you have the, with, with Esau, you right alongside it, mm. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. A perfect yeah. example. This study is, it seemed to me that's a good, did you find any others quoted? Yeah, I, 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 was, I, was open, I had it open while you were looking at it. I can, we can look at that. Again, the Good News Bible, why do you let us stray from your ways? Why yeah, do you make even, us? That's, that's halfway good if you, if you yeah. finish it. Why do you make us so stubborn that we turn away from you Come back for the sake of those who serve you, for the sake of people who have always been yours. Yeah, that, that one has, has, has a little bit of a eat either way, but the, the clear words was the, mm -hmm. the other way, and all, most of the other translations are, are similar to the Septuagint and the King mm -hmm. James and so forth. So. Okay, Carrie, you want to take us to James 1, 2, and 12 through 15? Yes. My brothers and sisters, Consider yourselves fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. Now, if those were, if that was what, that we, if we translated that word right there as temptations, we would have a problem with that, wouldn't we? Go ahead. Happy are those who remain faithful under trials, because when they succeed in passing such a test, they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love him. And in brackets it says, after reading again verses 13 and 14, and then we continue, if people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires them their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death wow That's good news bible Come yeah on. so you can see if you look back there you see verse 13 if people are tempted by such trials they must not say this temptation so there's three places the word is basically the same temptations trials temptations God created us to live in a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. That was his original plan. But he also placed the tree of knowledge of good and evil there to give Adam and Eve an opportunity to express their freedom and make a choice. Our Bible study guide says, Thus, the proposal to change the wording of the Lord's Prayer is not only unjustifiable and unbiblical, but also superficial rendering an impoverished theological and pastoral content. Such revision also is dangerous for another reason. It sets yet another precedent for changing the Word of God because of human and cultural impulse. Changing the wording in question in the Lord's Prayer will involve changing many other biblical texts and concepts. It is imperative to leave the text as it is and seek to understand it rather than to change it simply because it does not fit a particular theology or practical concern. That's from the Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page 42. Sometimes God will use a troubling experience to bring a person to an inspiring new realization. From the Bible Study Guide. By the third decade of the 18th century, George Frederick Handel 
Uh, the dates of his... His date. Yeah. Could consider himself to be an accomplished composer, having written various genres of music. As he wrote mostly non-religious music, many of the Church of England viewed him as a secular composer, which led to tensions in the Church. However, Handel always thrust, thrusted, thirsted, thirsted <laughs> for God and for salvation. In April of 1737, he suffered a stroke and had some other psychological affliction. Although he recovered, he soon landed in a financial, relational, and spiritual crisis. In conflict with the church, in conflict with many at the court and with other musicians, Handel thought he would collapse. On April 8, uh, 1741, he gave what he thought was his last concert and at the age of 56 retired from public life. But Handel was looking for a new song. He soon found it. A friend, Charles Jennings, shared with Handel the libretto that focused on the life of Christ, containing three parts. The prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, number one. Number two, the first coming of the Messiah and his passions. And number three, the future of the his second coming and the end of sin and the eternal acclamation of the Messiah. Handel rediscovered the glorious image of Jesus as the Messiah and Savior and decided to dedicate him to him to him an oratorio mm -hmm. an invitation from Dublin for Handel to compose something for a charity concert served as the catalyst and thus Messiah the greatest oratorio of all time was born do you remember how long it took him to do that whole thing? We'll read it very soon. Okay. <laughs> Handel was so absorbed by the writing of his new work that he wrote all three parts on some 260 pages in 24, 24 days. days. 24 days. Amazing. During those days, Handel did not leave his apartment at all, barely touching the food prepared for him. Sometimes during co composition, he would sob and cry at the great biblical text he included in the included or at the glory that he was seeing in Jesus the Messiah. When the new song, Messiah, was presented at the charity concert in Dublin, it collected four hundred pounds, which resulted in freeing a hundred and forty two men from the debtor's prison. I don't understand the debtor's prison. That, those were the days, the, the biblical times was, was like that too. If you couldn't pay your debts, you were sent to prison. So he collected 400 pounds. 400 pounds. 142 men out, out of prison. prison. Yeah. Pay off the debts of 142 yes. people. Yeah. Wow. But it also freed Handel from the spiritual and the multifaceted crucible he was in. And it, blessed, it has blessed numerous people around the globe since that time. Handel died on the morning of Good Friday, April 14, 1759, just eight days after, after having conducted his masterpiece, Messiah, for the last time, and was buried in Westminster Abbey. I've seen that yes. place. You probably have to. The monument in the Abbey, in his honor, represents him holding the manuscript of the Messiah, Part 3 at the place where it reads, I know that my re Redeemer liveth. I do teach a Sabbath yeah. school Bible study guy on page 42. So here, if you, if you get a chance to visit uh, Westminster Abbey, look, look for the, there's a section for artists and composers and so forth like that. And you will see, I mean, imagine, you know, he died and they buried him there. He's holding this, this document which says, I know my Redeemer liveth. That's amazing. Yes. Not every trial turns out well. Think of the story of John the Baptist. How do you think you would have done if you had been in the place of John the Baptist in prison? Imagine one day someone says, come with me, you know. It's not always a good sign to be let out of prison, huh? No. Have you ever felt that you were in a place where you were being tested or tried? 
or even tempted beyond your ability to withstand? This lesson is focused on the challenges that can come to us as Christians. We know that even worse challenges are coming in the future. Think of going through the time of trouble, and I, you know, just my mind is turning. We are getting ready to make a trip to the coast of Norway, and that's a place where Edvard Grieg used to live, just out just south of Bergen. And he would go down. There's a little tiny study, or whatever you want to call it, looking out over the, 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 the ocean beside him, uh, in front of him there, completely separated from everybody around. It's surrounded by trees and so forth. And that's where he did almost all of his composing. Mm. So, God has a wonderful plan for us. Uh, and he is preparing the precious souls to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Will we be there? That's the challenging question for each one of us. Uh, so, in light of this lesson, do you think God leads us into temptation? No. Does he test us? Does he test us? Okay, yeah. now you're, so, you're, you're what, going back to the original languages now. So one of the things I learned in school and has been reinforced is that there are several ways to learn. One is what you learn preparing for the test, and the other, another way is what you learn in the test yeah. by, the, by the wording and the way that, that things are, are in the examination. Yeah, and I... Um, and my, we, we're supposed to learn from the, quote, yeah. tests. My, my son lives in New York City, and he has a 10-year-old daughter, my granddaughter, who is in a school where everybody is trying to take tests to get advanced to go to special schools. She just passed a very difficult test, apparently, uh, allowing her to go on and to, to be advanced to some high-level school. Would you call that a temptation, or was that a trial, or was that a test? I mean, she's, re she's, you know, she's rejoicing. She, her parents are congratulating her for having gone through this test. So not every test is a temptation, and not every temptation is a test. But, of course, we, we always remember, in the light of the great controversy, that the devil is always there ready to bring us into temptation. But God will test us. He will test us, but he will not tempt us. And that's clearly what the Bible teaches. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for being with us and guiding us in the right paths. Starting with Psalms 23, we, we learned about leading to the valley of the shadow of death, but we end up uh, being fed at a banquet. And many other passages in Scripture, as we're discussing here now, uh, show that you, you lead us not into difficult situations that are not for our good. W there are times when we, we need to, to be tested. Uh, gold needs to be purified by testing, by being put in the crucible and so forth. And so, Lord, we ask that you will guide us. Uh, and be with us and help us not to be tempted uh, beyond our ability is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.